بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه ما بعد uh, Welcome back after a very long hiatus of uh, After a long hiatus of not having the halaqa Alhamdulillah, we are resuming the halaqat about the lives of the Sahaba. And today, inshallah ta'ala, we'll begin with one of the most famous of the Sahaba, uh, and that is Jabir ibn Abdullah ibn Haram. Jabir ibn Abdullah ibn Haram. Uh, Jabir ibn Abdullah ibn Haram was from the Khazraj, from the Ansar. And he's one of the first of the Ansar that we are doing. As of yet, I have concentrated primarily on the Muhajirun and on the Quraysh. Uh, now we need to move on to the Ansar. Inshallah, the goal is finish up the primary Ansar and then move on to the mothers of the believers. And then inshallah, we'll conclude the series of the uh, lies of the Sahaba. And one of the most famous and one of the most interesting stories regarding uh, the Ansar is about Jabir ibn Abdullah uh, from the tribe of Banu Salama. The tribe of Banu Salama is famous for many reasons. Of them, uh, there's a hadith in Sahih Bukhari which is one of their most um, famous blessings. The Banu Salama were a tribe that used to live around Masjid Qiblatayn, the famous masjid in Medina. And they would come to the masjid of the Prophet every single day for Maghrib, for Isha, for as many prayers as they could. And that's like a 45 minute walk, around a 45 minute walk uh, to get uh, to uh, the Prophet's masjid. And they would come so frequently they decided to sell their houses and sell their properties and lands and use the money to purchase houses is close to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is the tribe of Jabir, the Banu Salama. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi heard of their news. This was a big sacrifice for them to leave their houses and come closer. And he said to them, Ya Bani Salamata, diyarukum tuktabu atharukum. O Banu Salama, diyarukum, stay in your houses, tuktabu atharukum. Your footsteps are being recorded. Meaning you should stay where you are. Allah will bless you for coming all the way to the my masjid. So this is the famous tribe of the Banu Salama. Jabir is the Sahabi, the son of a Sahabi. His father is one of the most famous of the Ansar, but we only have two or three tidbits about him. Yet those tidbits are worth gold, in fact, infinitely more precious than gold. Jabir was the son of Abdullah ibn Haram. And Abdullah ibn Haram, he died a very early death in the seerah, so we don't know much about him. But what we do know uh, is that he was one of the original 12 people who gave the first covenant of Aqaba. So there were two covenants of Aqaba, if you remember. So the father of Jabir is one of the earliest converts of Medina, one of the first batch of Muslims, and he attended the first covenant of Aqaba. His friend Ka'b ibn Malik uh, had, had given him da'wah to Islam before going for Hajj. And when they went for Hajj, and this is uh, in the first year of the Treaty of Aqaba, he converted to Islam on the way to Mecca. And so he saw the Prophet Sallallahu and he took the Shahada, and he took the first covenant of Aqaba. The next year he decided to go again and this time he took his son Jabir. So this is the first time that Jabir is seeing the Prophet wasallam, and Jabir was probably around 15 years old at that time, a young boy. So Jabir and his father Abdullah, they both attended the second treaty of Aqaba. So this is one of the blessings of Jabir and the father of Jabir. They both attended the second treaty of Aqaba. And when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam migrated to Medina, Abdullah ibn Haram was one of those who always attended his knees, always was with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Abdullah ibn Haram attended the battle of Badr and Uhud, the father. He participated in Badr and he participated in Uhud. However, the son Jabir did not participate in Badr and Uhud. Why? He was above the age of participation. What was the age of participation? Who remembers? How old did you have to be? 14. Above the age of 14. And Jabir was 15. Uh, most likely he was 15. It wasn't because of age. So why did Jabir not go? He himself tells us. My father prevented me from going. My father forbade me from going. Uh, Badr and Uhud. And the night before the battle of Uhud, he called me to his side, to his room. And he said to me, Ya Bunay, oh my son, I have a premonition that I will be of the first people to die tomorrow. And this is something that we believe in as Muslims, that sometimes this is not, this is not inspiration that is given to prophets. This is a premonition that righteous people have. Okay? Uh, in Arabic, it's called firasa. 
And Firasa Umar bin Khattab said, Ittaqu firasat al-mu'min. This is not a hadith, by the way. Ittaqu firasat al-mu'min. Be careful of the premonition or the intuition of the believer because the intuition of the believer is true. So the father says to the son, I sense I'm going to die tomorrow of the first people to die. He tells his son this the day before. And he says, I cannot let you go to Uhud because I have nine daughters. And you are my only son. And you are the most beloved human being to me after the Prophet wasallam. So stay here and take care of your sisters. And after I am gone, I have a debt that has to be repaid. So work to pay my debt off. And the next day, Jabir ibn Abdullah heard the news that his father, Abdullah ibn Haram, was the very first shaheed. This is before Khalid and Walid came back. In the very first uh, section of the battle where the Muslims were winning, where the Muslims were on the upper hand, at that stage, Abdullah ibn Haram was killed, a shaheed. He died a shaheed and he was buried on the plains of um, Uhud. And when Jabir radiallahu an heard the news, he was absolutely devastated and heartbroken. And there's a beautiful hadith in Sunan at Tirmidhi that uh, deals with this incident. Uh, hadith number 3010. Uh, Jabir ibn Abdullah said that the Prophet sallallahu saw me and said, and, and said, O oh, Jabir, why are you so depressed? Why are you munkasir? Munkasir means why are you down with your head and you're so sad? Why are you so sad? So I said, Ya Rasulullah, istushhid abi qutila yawma Uhud. Oh, Messenger of Allah, my father was a shaheed. As you know, he died in the battle of Uhud. And he left a large family and he left me in debt. Okay, so he's saying, how can I not be sad? I'm a young kid, I'm a young boy, 15 years old. My father is dead. I have nine sisters. On top of that, I have a debt I have to repay. Of course, life is difficult for me. So he's saying, Ya Rasulullah, you know my situation. So the Prophet wasallam said, and this is one of the most amazing hadith about Abdullah ibn Haram, and it shows the status of the shaheed. أَفَلَا أُبَشِّرُكَ بِمَا لَقِيَ اللَّهَ بِهِ أَبَاكَ Shouldn't I give you the good news of how Allah met your father? So he said, of course, O Messenger of Allah. So the Prophet wasallam said, ما كلم الله أحدا قط إلا من وراء حجاب. No one has spoken directly to Allah except behind a veil, a hijab. As for your father, أحياه الله أباك. Allah resurrected your father back means his his shahid is alive, as you know. Your father is أحياء. فكلمه كفاحا. He spoke to him. كفاح means face to face. I.e. There is no hijab. فكلمه كفاحا فقال يا عبدي تمنى علي أعطيك الله says to Abdullah bin Haram wish I will give you whatever you wish I will give you this is the status of Abdullah bin Haram no Sahabi that we know of has this blessing this is the father of Jabir no Sahabi you know of has this blessing the Prophet said Allah said O Abdullah wish I will grant you your wish and who can tell me what is the wish of the Shaheed Exactly. So Abdullah says to Allah Azza wa Jal, Ya Rabb, O oh my Rabb, Tuhyini, bring me back to the life of this world. فَأُقْتَلَ فِيكَ ثَانِيَ Let me become shaheed again for you. That's the only wish of the shaheed. I want to come back so that I can be shaheed again. So Allah Azza wa Jal, قَالَ الرَّبُّ Azza wa Jal, إِنَّهُ قَدْ سَبَقَ مِنِّي أَنَّهُمْ إِلَيْهَا لَا يُرْجَعُونَ I have already decreed they are not going to come back to this world. And Allah then revealed in the Quran, Surah Ali Imran. So this ayah came down when Jabir asked the Prophet about his father. This ayah came down and we recited to this day. Don't think that the people who have been killed in the way of Allah are dead. Rather, they are alive with Allah and Allah is taking care of them. So this ayah that we are all familiar with, we all know it, it came down for the father of Jabir and of the blessings of the father that Allah spoke to him directly. So Abdullah, uh, sorry, Jabir ibn Abdullah did not attend Badr. He did not attend Uhud. After this, oh, I forgot one more thing, sorry. The battle of Uhud. Abdullah is being buried. Abdullah, the father, is being buried. And as they lift his body up and take it to the grave, 
uh, Abdullah's sister, Jabir's aunt, Abdullah's sister, her name was Fatima bint Amr. She begins to cry, a natural cry, not wailing. She begins to cry. And the Prophet ﷺ said, regardless of whether you cry or not, doesn't matter how, whether you're crying or not, I have seen the angels covering the body of Abdullah with their wings until you carried him away, until beyond the sight, meaning. So, Again, there were so many shaheed in the battle of Uhud. But Abdullah had certain specific blessings. And really, that's all we know about him. Subhanallah. Yani we don't know many stories because he died so early. He died in the battle of Uhud. We don't know much about him. But these two blessings, and both are mentioned in authentic books of hadith. Allah spoke to him directly. And Allah revealed the Quran because of him. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I saw the angels covering him until he was buried. All of this is enough of a blessing for Abdullah ibn Haram. After this point in time, Jabir attended every single expedition with the Prophet ﷺ. He says, hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. And this is, I began my seerah lectures, what, six years ago with these, these, some of these hadith. When we talked about how many ghazawat and the difference between ghazwa and sariyya. This is that hadith I began so many years ago that the, Jabir ibn Abdullah said, the Prophet ﷺ participated in 21 ghazawat. And we talked about how many ghazawat and sariyya from the beginning of the seerah. If you remember that, uh, if you remember is a big if, but... Going back that many years, I mentioned how many ghazawat and how many saraya, what's the difference between them. This was one of the main evidences that was quoted. This is that hadith Jabir is saying. The Prophet ﷺ, ghaza, Rasulullah ﷺ, uh, the Prophet ﷺ did 21 ghazawat and I participated in how many? 19. 19. Not can be 20 because he didn't do Uhud and Badr. Right? So subhanallah. Jabir ibn Abdullah participated in every single ghazwa after his father passed away. He couldn't because when he was alive, he's listening to his father. And this shows us obedience to the father is more sacred than even jihad fi sabilillah with the Prophet ﷺ. Think about that. Obedience to the father and mother is more sacred than even jihad fi sabilillah with the Prophet ﷺ. He did not do so to honor his father, as soon as his father passes away, then there is no prohibition. So he participates in every single ghazwa. Now, uh, there are many minor incidents of Jabir, but the main emphasis today is going to be the most famous story of Jabir ibn Abdullah. It is one of my favorite stories of the seerah. It is one of the favorite stories of every single scholar of seerah and hadith. Uh, and it is one of those really interesting stories that is mentioned in every single book of hadith without exception. Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawud, Tirmidhi. I mean, every book. There is no book of hadith in the classical time of Islam except that this famous incident with Jabir is mentioned and in fact books have been written treatises have been written about this one incident it's a famous incident it is called the incident of Jabir and the camel the incident of Jabir and the camel and I have collected some of the narrations and I've uh, briefly uh, derive some benefits. Ibn Hajjan and the others, they mentioned there are more than a hundred benefits you can derive. If we were to do that, we'd spend three halaqat just on the incident of Jabir. But this is a beautiful incident that really shows how uh, uh, the, the relationship that the Prophet ﷺ had with Jabir. And it's in the first person. Jabir is narrating. Hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim and every book of Hadith and each book adds a few details that the other does not add. And he says, I went... On an expedition with the Prophet wasallam one time. But I had an old camel. And the camel lagged behind the army until I was the last person in the whole expedition coming back from Medina. Lo and behold, the Prophet wasallam came up to me. And he said, who is this? Who are you? Who is this? I said, Jabir. He said, why are you so sad? And... He said, my father has passed away, the same hadith that we read before, and he has left a large family and a debt, and all that I own is this old, useless camel. This is what I have. That's all the property I have. That's, I have nothing else. So the Prophet ﷺ said, kneel down, sit down with the camel. Take the camel and make the camel come down. So I made the camel sit down, and the Prophet ﷺ sat his camel down as well. He then took his stick, you know the things that you hit the animal with, and he blew on it and hit my camel. And he then kicked my camel so that it stood up and it was 
more energetic than it had ever been before. And it began galloping so fast that it caught up with the army until it was the furthermost in front of the entire expedition. And I had to pull it back until finally I came back to where the Prophet ﷺ was. Okay? So you can imagine 10, 15 minutes have gone by that the camel has now become the most energetic. It is now zooming ahead and he has to rein the camel in, keep on slowing it down until finally he manages to come back to the Prophet ﷺ. Then the Prophet ﷺ turned to me and said, Bi'niha. Sell me this camel. Now I want it. Sell me this camel. He said, Fastahyaytu. I was embarrassed. Means, what do I do now? This is my only possession. It used to be pretty cheap. Now it's now it's been fine-tuned. Huh? Oil change done, everything. What is it called? The makeover? What is it called, huh? The rejuvenated. It's a <laughs> it's a Cadillac now. MashaAllah is now. Um, Cadillac is still old school. That's 70s. Now we go to the Teslas. Teslas. <laughs> so the camel is now, mashallah, tabarakallah, upgraded. And this is the only possession of Jabir. So you can imagine he has no money. He has no cash. And in those days, as I explained to him many, many times, you don't, there's no income. There's no monthly wage. You get money maybe once a year, once every two years. Then you keep that cash and you send it. Otherwise, primarily your possessions are food, grain, maybe land, animals. So now the Prophet is saying, I want it. Istahyayt. I was embarrassed. Like, I don't want to sell. But at the same time, he's asking me to sell. So I said, Ya Rasulullah, huwa lak. I'll give it to you as a gift. Like, I can't sell you the camel. I'll give it to you as a gift. So the Prophet ﷺ said, غفر الله لك. May Allah forgive you. No, except with its price. No, I'm not going to take a gift. Give me its price. And Jabir repeated, I will gift it to you, Rasulullah. But the Prophet ﷺ repeated, غفر الله لك. لا إلا بثمنها. No, except with its price. Jabir says, I counted 20. 25 times the Prophet ﷺ made dua for me. 25 times, back and forth, back and forth. I'm not going to sell it to you. I can't give it to you. غفر الله لك. You have to sell it to me. He counted Jabir. And of course, we're going to come here. What a big blessing that is. 25 times. Then I said, okay, I will sell it to you. How much? So the Prophet ﷺ said, I will buy it for one dirham. One dirham is like five dollars. One dirham is like five dollars. After he wanted to give it for free, now that it's time to sell, and he finds out it's one dirham, he says, Ya Rasulullah, then I will be in a, lo- a loss, right? It's too little. I can't sell it to you for a dirham. So he said, okay, two dirhams. He said, Ya Rasulullah, that is not the price of a camel. Like, it's like ten bucks. And this is a camel, it's a car. Like, you don't sell. It's... So he kept on increasing until finally it reached an uqiyya. An uqiyya is basically a bag which is a decent amount for a camel of this nature. So I said, okay, an uqiyya of silver is good enough. Okay, I will take it. The Prophet ﷺ said, Aradit, are you sure? You're happy? Uqiyya is fine? So he said, yes, but I have a condition. The Prophet said, what is the condition? He says that I can ride the camel till I get back to Medina. I don't have to walk to Medina. Okay? So the Prophet ﷺ said, you have that condition. Then he noticed, so some time has gone, maybe it's the next hour, two hours, some time has gone. Then he noticed me hurrying or rushing. So he asked me why. In another version, then I said to him, so either he said or he noticed one of the two. Then I said to him, Ana hadithu ahdin. I am newly married, Ya Rasulullah. I am a newly wed. So basically I want to get back home. You know, it's been a while, I've been away from my wife, I want to get back home. So he's giving an excuse why he is now in a rush. So the Prophet sallallahu said, May Allah bless you, barakallahu lak. Uh, did you marry a bikr or a thayyib, a young girl or an older lady? Which one did you marry? So he said, and it could also be translated as a virgin or a widow. Both are allowed in this meaning, bikr or thayyib. So uh, he said, I married an older lady. So the Prophet said, why not a younger lady? Because he was at this time, at this hadith, probably he's 17 years old. 
Okay, and of course, you know, in marriages took place in those days at the age of 16, 17. It's a standard age to get married. So the Prophet is saying, why didn't you marry somebody your age? Right? You can play with her, she can play with you. You can laugh with her, she can laugh with you. Somebody your age will be more munasib for you. Why didn't you marry somebody your age? So he said, Ya Rasulullah, my father passed away. So again, the same hadith, which is now in more detail. I already quoted the hadith in, in Tirmidhi. It's a more detailed one. My father passed away. He left nine daughters, right? So he had nine sisters. One son and nine daughters. So Jabir has nine younger sisters to take care of. He's the eldest. He has nine sisters. And I did not want to add a lady similar to their age. Because if he married a girl who's younger than him, it'll be like his sister, right, age-wise. And I needed a lady who could take care of them and nourish them and, you know, be a mother figure to them. SubhanAllah. So he married a lady that was older for the sake of his uh, sisters. So the Prophet said, Asabta, you have done right. This is now you explain to me why this is the correct thing you have done. And uh, he said to me, Don't enter at night. They were close to the city. Don't enter at night. Wait till the next morning, basically, so that the one who has not shaved may shave, the one who has not combed may comb, the one who hasn't taken a bath may take a bath. Now, pause here. Remember, uh, in those days, uh, generally speaking, obviously you had no idea when the army would come back. One crier would come a few hours before the army. Say, oh, we're back, we're back. Okay, so Jabir is being told, wait for that guy to come. So the whole city knows you're coming. Your wife will then know you're coming. Don't surprise her at night. She's going to be asleep. And of course, in those days, you know, there's no protection, no security. Uh, it would be, maybe she'd be alarmed. She'd be terrified. Who's knocking on the door? Who's coming in? Wait until the morning so she knows you're coming and she can prepare herself. She's not ready for you yet. Okay? So don't surprise her and she's not taken a bath. She hasn't combed her hair. She let her prepare herself for you. So wait until the morning means after the crier has come and given the news that the army is one distance away. That's where they would send one person uh, to, you know, everybody wants to know what happened, who won the battle, the details. So one person would go before. The Prophet is saying, wait until that crier who has uh, uh, the, his, his job to do that until he comes and enter the next morning. So I entered the city and I met my uncle and I told him what had happened, meaning about the camel. But he reprimanded me. Why would you sell your camel? You needed the camel. Now what are you going to do now? Then I returned to my wife and I told her that I had sold the camel. And she said to me, Sam'an wa ta'a. Go and give the camel to the Prophet. Hear and obey. You have sold it, khalas. No, you cannot now back out. Go give it to the Prophet. So immediately the next uh, morning, I went with the camel, sad and disheartened, and I tied it outside the house of the Prophet. There were posts there, whatnot. So I tied it outside the house of the Prophet and I went inside the masjid waiting for him to wake up and to see. So he came outside, he said, What is this? Where is why is there a camel outside my house? And they said, This is the camel of Jabir. So he said, Aina Jabir. So Jabir stood up. And the Prophet said, Oh Bilal, go pay him the uqiya. Go pay him that amount was zid an increase. Go pay him what I promised and add a little bit more. So he gave me the uqiyya and increased. When I turned around to leave, he said, Ya Jabir, ya bina akhi. O Jabir, O nephew, O son, O young child, O young boy, did you think that we would trick you out of your camel? Take your money and take your camel. Take your money and take your camel. Okay? So Jabir said that that amount that the Prophet gave, it remained with me and continued to grow and grow and grow. Means I invested it and it continued to be with me. And to this day, I can still see its effects in my house. And it is said, the narrator said, that anytime somebody met Jabir, he would always have spare coins in his pockets, in his pouch, basically. You know, they had a purse or something that they had a you know, thing that they would put their money in. He would always just have coins like from, from uh, you know, the barakah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is the famous hadith of Jabir and the camel. And there are so many benefits that we can derive. Of these benefits, firstly, as I mentioned, actually a, fiqh, a hadithi benefit, is that this is one of those rare hadith that has been reported in every single book of hadith without exception. That's rare. 
to find a hadith that is reported in every single book, it is the hadith of Jabir. And in fact, as I said, people have written in medieval times and classical times entire treatises, many books, small booklets, and the narrations of the hadith of Jabir are well known. Uh, the narrators mentioned that this expedition that Jabir is coming back from, it was the expedition of Dhatul Riqa. I mentioned it in my Sira classes. Um, it's been a while since I made fun of the note taker. I don't even know how many salams I have been given to you for the last six months all over the world. They say, give our salams to the note taker and uh, whatnot. I'll give you all those messages later on, inshallah. So I'm saying the note taker, of course, remembers Ghazwa to Dhatul Riqa. Of course, he knows exactly how many people fought on both sides and the names of the tribes and what happened and what year it was in. All of this is known in his notes. Ghazwa to that al-Riqa' took place around 10 months after the Battle of Uhud. So uh, Jabir has just lost his father. It's been 10 months. And he's gotten married. And now this incident takes place. Of the benefits we derive from the hadith of Jabir and the camel is the humbleness of the Prophet wasallam. that Jabir is surprised that he's at the end of the army and lo and behold, who's next to him? The Prophet wasallam. So the Prophet ﷺ is monitoring who's at the back. And he is intentionally slowing his own camel down to see who is at the back. And it is so rare, I would say, exception rather than a normal rule, to find a leader who is worried about the lowest of the low. And that was what makes our Prophet ﷺ the Prophet. Yani who else is there that's monitoring the lowest of the low or the, the one who's the most behind in the army? Even Jabir is surprised. He's all alone. He looks up and guess who's next to him? The one person who should be at the very front. He is with Jabir. And of course, this is well known. Our Prophet ﷺ was always with the weak and the meek. In fact, in the hadith of Ibn Majah, he actually said, Utlubuni fi du'afa'ikum. Find me amongst your weak people. Find me amongst the lowly people because It is because of the weak that Allah will give His rizq to you and that Allah will send His help upon you. This hadith is Ibn Majah. It's actually a beautiful hadith. Think about it. Why does Allah's nasr come down? It's not because of the rich and the powerful and the arrogant. Allah's help comes upon the weakest of the weak, upon the most mudhloom, upon the ones who think they have no one to help them other than Allah. It's because of them, Allah says, your rizq comes down. It's not because of the rich and the elite. The reason why it rains, the reason why there's crops growing, the reason why there's so many barakat, the number one reason is because of your du'afa, your weakest amongst you. And that's why the true leader will look at the weakest of the flock. And subhanAllah, how difficult that is. Wallahi, how difficult that is to ignore or to overlook the rich and the powerful and to rather look at the the, the weak and the lowly. And this is our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I don't need to tell you all of these incidents in the seerah about his humility. The lady, the hadith in Bukhari says, كَانَ فِي عَقْلِهَا شَيْءٍ She had a screw loose. There was a problem with her mentally. And so she came to the Prophet directly and said, Ya Rasulullah, I need to speak to you privately. It was well known she had, uh, you know, she's mentally uh, uh, not sane. But she came up and she said, I need to speak to you privately. So the Prophet said, where do you want me to speak? She said, in this alleyway. So he followed and the alleyway in the public she followed her and he spoke with her until she explained whatever problem nobody knows what it is and he calmed her down and then he returned to the companions and he, imagine somebody who's mentally you know not not normal right still he's going and listening to her need and then coming back and it is well known hadith in Sahih Muslim that on the cold winter days of Medina the children would come running to the process and with uh, buckets of water or canisters of water so that he could dip and there would be barakah and they would bring it back. On these cold days he would go and, and he would dip his hands. Of course it is known his humility in his house and all of this it is something that is well known. This hadith only proves it. He is at the back of the army with Jabir ibn Abdullah. Now in asking Jabir who are you? Realistically, the Prophet knew exactly who he was. Think about it. Yani there is a reason why he's at the back. He's noticed Jabir is in the back. He is intentionally coming back. But in asking, who are you? Right? It is, and Jabir was a child at the time. I mean, child meaning relatively 16, 17 years old. He's a young, he's not famous or elite at this point in time. Eventually, he will be very famous towards the end of his life. Right now, he's just a kid, literally a teenager. And he wouldn't expect that he is that known or famous, you know, to the Prophet Of course, the Prophet knew him from the death of his father, and he consoled him at the death of his father. But now when you ask somebody, which, who are you, what's your name? So it will cheer him up immensely. 
It'll make him feel, oh, this is a direct, private conversation. So he says it is Jabir ibn Abdullah. And the Prophet then says, why so sad? Why are you so depressed? And once again, we are noticing, the Prophet noticing these small details. Right? What is the matter? Now, why again think he is Rasulullah, Khatim al Anbiya wal Mursaleen, and he is asking a 15 year old kid, why are you depressed? Think about that. Just think about why is our Prophet the best human being? Because every person in his presence felt that he is concerned about me and only me. You know this from the seerah. Every person felt I am the most special out of all of the people. And that genuine concern is very, very rare and difficult to find. Especially amongst people of fame and power and influence, you get immune to the attention showered upon you. You start treating people you know, normally with contempt or whatnot. But our Prophet ﷺ was not like that. Everybody felt, I am the most special person in his presence. And again, the famous hadith in Tirmidhi that I've, I've mentioned it some, some time ago, where Amr ibn al-As converted to Islam, and he converted very late. Remember, he converted uh, the last of the Muhajirun. So he converted the uh, eighth year of the Hijrah, the very last of the Muhajirun to convert, Amr ibn al-As. And Amr narrates this hadith, that I came to the Prophet you know, in public in front of everybody in the masjid, and I asked him, Ya Rasulullah, man ahabbu nasi ilayk? Who is the most beloved person to you? Thinking, he would say, it's me. Okay, now think about that. Amr ibn al-As, we all know he's not of the Ashra Mubashara. He's not of the Badriyun. The, of the, he just became a Muhajir. Okay, the very last batch of the Muhajirun, right? The story of Khalid ibn Walid and Uthman ibn The very last batch, remember if you remember the story from the Seerah. He's the last batch. He didn't participate in any Ghazwa until the conquest of Mecca. And yet he thinks... I am the most beloved. Why? Because of the care and the concern the Prophet has for every Sahabi. And so the Prophet responded, what was the answer? Everybody knows. What was the answer? Aisha. So he became embarrassed, like, no, I didn't mean amongst women, I meant amongst men. So, and still he's thinking it'll be me. Okay? So, what did the Prophet say? Abuha, Abu Bakr. So he said, okay, next. He said, Umar, okay, next, said Uthman, some versions say others, and then goes after that, we became quiet. I got the point, okay? Yeah, and if you're going to ask an awkward question, you're going to get the honest response. But the point here is, here is now, we see why that is the case. Like, it, Jabir is the center of attention right now. The process is giving him the full attention. So Jabir now feels a sense of ease and comfort. And this shows again the care that the process gave to everybody. Uh, in the, uh, obviously the, the, the miracle of the camel, again one of the, uh, uh, the mu'jizat of the Prophet I don't need to go over all of the mu'jizat, understood. Some simple dua and a simple hit and tapping of the camel makes the camel so powerful. And by the way, this also shows that uh, the tapping of the, the, the animals that is done, the, the, the gentle hitting of the animals, this is permissible in Islam. Uh, what is impermissible is torture, is pain and suffering. As for the, you know, like when you have a horse and you hit it or whatnot, this is how you communicate to the horse that you want it to go faster. And this is not something that is in any way or fashion haram. This is what is how communication is done. The animal is not in pain. And there's a stick that you just hit the, the, the camel with in a certain place. And that's not something that the camel is... Is tortured at it's the message how you get to the camel to be fast so the process is using that stick and he is using his foot and he pushes the camel to stand up and when the camel stands up it becomes the fastest camel it is understood this is a miracle of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam of the fiqhi benefits as well we get here it is permissible to ask somebody to sell something even if they haven't advertised it for sale you may ask somebody about purchasing an item even if it's not advertised for sale, completely halal, okay? So you uh, go to somebody's house, you like something, say, oh, is that for sale? I like to buy it. It's halal. Now, whether it's wise or not, it's up to you, but it is completely halal to ask anybody if they want to sell something for any price. Now, our scholars mention that it is makruh to ask, it is makruh to ask somebody when you know that he's only going to say yes out of modesty, out of bashfulness because of your position and his position. You should only ask equals. 
You should not ask when you have such a high level of privilege over that he's going to feel, I have to sell. And our scholars say the only reason the Prophet did it is because he didn't want to actually buy. And as we know at the end of the hadith, he doesn't actually buy the camel. Otherwise, it would be makruh because you shouldn't, they say, purchase something with the sword of haya. Don't have the sword of modesty dangling or the sword of like embarrassment, like a very strong, powerful figure comes and wants something from you. How are you going to say no to that? That is not a fair uh, power balance here. So our scholars say it is makru in that case. But in our Prophet's case, because he didn't actually want to buy, it's not makru to do that. It becomes uh, permissible. Um, we also see here the honesty of Javir. He admitted to us in the hadith, I did not want to sell. And he didn't have to. Remember, he's narrating this hadith when he is, you know, 70 years old or something. Uh, Jabir lived till he was 94, as we'll talk about. Jabir lived until he was 94 years old. So we're talking about he's narrating this hadith when he is an old man. Uh, towards the end of his life, he became blind as well. Uh, and he's narrating these hadith. He didn't have to tell his audience about his own weaknesses. But his honesty is shining through. I didn't want to sell. He mentions that so that don't think that I'm being something extra holy or, or whatnot. No, I did not want to sell. And this shows again the honesty of Jabir. Uh, but he thought to himself, the process is asking. And so from not wanting to sell, he jumps to the highest level of akhlaq and that is gifted. And that requires a strong leap of faith and a strong sense of generosity and a strong belief in the blessings of serving Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As a young child of 16 years old, he understands Allah will reward him if he makes the Prophet sallallahu happy. And so he says, I'll gift it to you, Ya Rasulullah. And it really shows how much iman this little kid must have had. He's a teenager, really. How much iman he must have had, knowing that he has financial responsibility, knowing this is the only thing his father left him, knowing he has nine sisters, and he says, take it, Ya Rasulullah. And the back and forth 25 times indicates it wasn't a half-hearted gesture. He meant it. You know, it's one thing, take it. And the Prophet said, I want to buy it. Okay, khalas, buy it. No. 20. 25 times. No, Ya Rasulullah, it's a gift. No, I insist it's a gift. 25 times means what? He had made up his mind. He is giving it as a gift. And this shows from the haya and the khajal, immediately that iman comes out and he goes, okay, if the Prophet wants it, it shall be his. Such a strong iman, we will just marvel at that sense of faith in this young child. And also think about it as well, that uh, Jabir counted. Look at how eager he is to see how many times the Prophet was saying, غفر الله لك يا Jabir. He's counting. 25 times the Prophet made istighfar for me. And our scholars mention that in the entire seerah, we do not know of any sahabi for whom istighfar was made in so much quantity in such a short period of time. Because the whole conversation was back and forth 25 times. غفر الله لك بعنيها غفر الله لك بعنيها غفر الله لك 25 times. And Jabir is using wordings and phrases. No, Ya Rasulullah, it's a gift, Ya Rasulullah. I insist, Ya Rasulullah. Take it, Ya Rasulullah. No. غفر الله لك غفر الله لك غفر الله لك May Allah forgive you. I want to purchase it. No sahabi has had this blessing of 25 times istighfar in the space of a few minutes uh, as far as we know. And this is, uh, it is said, the highest blessing of Jabir that the Prophet did for Jabir. So the Jabir says, khalas, I will sell it to you. And then of course begins the one dirham. And he goes, what? One dirham? And this shows us how weak are human beings, how psychologically challenged we are. You would rather give something for free then sell it for a paltry price. He is willing to give it for free. Once the bartering begins, and it said, okay, give it to me for a dirham. What? A dirham? That's not fair. Immediately look. He was willing to give it for free. And this is, subhanAllah, you know what is said is that when you sell something for a high price, you value it. And when it's for free, it doesn't have the same value, you know. So when you're giving it for free, okay, khalas, take it. But now that you're going to sell it, you cannot sell it for a very cheap price. 
And this shows us again how weak human beings are. He's not willing to sell it for a loss. Now, the question is, why did the Prophet insist to buy and then offer a paltry sum? Why? And the response is obvious. Our Prophet is essentially teasing Jabir. We have, I've given a khutbah, was it a year ago, about the humor of the Prophet It's online. Okay, I've given a khutbah about the jokes of the Prophet Our Prophet was actually a humorous man. And all of his jokes were clean and halal and true and perfect. And in fact, there are even fiqhi benefits as we talked about in, uh, in that khutbah I mentioned as well. That there are even fiqhi benefits found in the jokes of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That essentially he is teasing Jabir. As we know the ending, he doesn't know. Jabir does not know the ending. We know the ending, what it's going to be, right? So he's teasing Jabir. Have it for two bucks. Two bucks a camel, ya Rasulullah. Okay, khalas, have it for three. I can't sell you a camel for three dollars. Okay, khalas. and he keeps on increasing because he wanted to give Jabir something. Jabir doesn't know this. Right? And of course, there are so many uh, you know, stories of uh, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you know, uh, of them is the famous one where uh, the Prophet would literally throw, we would even call it yani, play pranks on somebody. Literally play pranks on somebody. The famous uh, sahabi whom uh, there was a du'aba, there was joking. You know, some people, uh, uh, when you meet them, you, you have a special relationship. You just always crack jokes at each other in a very loving way. There are some of those friends that are special type of friendships that you just, you know, have that thing. So there was one sahabi who would come and trade in Medina. He wasn't living in Medina. He would come and trade and leave. And the Prophet had that relationship with him. And uh, one day he came and the Prophet saw him from, the, uh, from behind. He, he did not see the Prophet And the Prophet became happy. Oh, this man is here. So he came from behind quietly without telling him who he is. And the Prophet then held on to him from his back and said, Man yashtari hadha al-abd minni. Okay. Who's going to purchase this abd from me? Okay. So from the buyer... He became the merchandise that is sold, right? And it's a joke, it's halal because abd could mean slave and abd could mean worshiper of Allah. And all of the jokes of the Prophet are correct. There's nothing that is any falsehood or any lie. Man yashtari had al abd. Who's going to purchase this abd? And when the Prophet said abd, he means servant of Allah. He doesn't mean slave, right? And so the man became, you know, frustrated. What is this? And then when he saw it is the Prophet, وسلم, he just became limp. And he allowed his back to touch the chest of the Prophet ﷺ to get the maximum, you know, uh, barakah of the Prophet wasallam. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, if you want to sell me, ana rakhis, I'm cheap, who's going to buy me? My price is so cheap, who's going to buy me? And our Prophet ﷺ said, no, rather you are expensive in the eyes of Allah. You are ghali in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're very expensive. So these are the jokes of the Prophet ﷺ. So this is one of those examples of a halal teasing, like, Nothing is wrong if you say I want to buy it for a dirham, uh, for one silver coin. Nothing is wrong in saying that. Uh, and it's going to kind of, it's a tease to Jabir because I don't want to sell it for a dirham. So it increases until finally he gets to the uqiyya. In Jabir saying no, we also learn it is permissible to say no even to the Prophet wasallam if the context indicates that this is not a shari command. This is not a shari command. The context indicates that. It's a buying and selling transaction. You're not sinful for saying no if it's not a shari command. And this is also demonstrated in the famous hadith of uh, Barira. The famous hadith of Barira. Barira was a, uh, a, a slave uh, girl who was freed and she was married to uh, a, uh, a, another slave. And when a person becomes free, they have the option of remaining married or annulling the marriage. And uh, her husband's name was Mughith. Barira and Mughith were married. And Barira became a free lady. And so she decided to divorce her husband. This is one of the times that a woman is allowed to divorce the husband. Or the technical term is fasq of the marriage. But the point is to annul the marriage. So Barira decides to annul the marriage. And Mughith now uh, is in love with Barira. And Mughith uh, ibn Abbas said, I remember as a child seeing Mughith walking behind Barira crying in the streets of Medina, begging her to take him back. Okay, He's begging her, take me back, we can do it, we can make it work out. We don't know the stories of why there was this animosity or whatnot, but the Prophet said to 
uh, Abbas, Ibn Abbas's father, Abbas, he said, Oh Abbas, aren't you amazed how much Mughith loves Barira and how much Barira despises Mughith? Aren't you amazed at this relationship, right? Then the Prophet ﷺ said, Oh Barira, why don't you take him back? Why don't you take him back? And Barira said, Ata'muruni ya Rasulullah? Is this an amr? In which case, what? I'll do it. Ata'muruni ya Rasulullah? So here she is asking, is this an amr? And he said, La innama ana shafi'. I'm just reconciling. I, my job is just to try to patch things up. I mean, if it's possible, it's possible, it's not, it's not. So then she responded with the scorn that only a woman can possibly muster. La hajat I have no need of this guy. And the marriage did not resume. So uh, the point is that she asks the Prophet what? Is it a command? And this demonstrates, just like over here from the hadith of Anas as well, it demonstrates that those things that the Prophet is not commanding you, and by the way, this cannot apply to us now. It's gone now. Because this is our Prophet when he lived in Medina, he has to do things as a human being. right? For us, this is now something we just learn in the books of fiqh and whatnot. In reality, the hadith that he commanded us for ibadat, for rituals, for tahara, this is our sharia. It becomes our sharia. But when he lived in Medina, buying and selling, doing other things of this nature, so subhanAllah, he is a human being in those things. He doesn't have to be obeyed in those places. And the sahaba understood this. So uh, Jabir says, I'm not interested in this part until finally we get to the hadith of uh, to the amount of an uqiyya. We also learn from here that once the price is negotiated, it is sunnah and it is healthy and it is good to do what? To make sure that the person is happy. Because the Prophet confirmed with him, are you okay with this price? And this is a very interesting tangent of Islamic fiqh, which will shock many of you because most Muslims never heard of these things. The majority of madhahib, the Hanif, the sorry, the Maliki, Shafi'is, and Hanbalis, they actually have this in their books of fiqh, and it is something well known, but unfortunately we have lost these basic etiquettes. And that is that from a fiqhi perspective, you are allowed to annul a contract as long as you haven't separated after doing the contract. Like if you change your mind on the spot, you get the point here. You purchase the car, you hand it over five thousand, and then you're like, "No, nah, man, that wasn't that wasn't." Uh, he sold me a lemon. I'm not gonna do this. Give it back. I changed my mind. Now in Western law or whatever, it's like khalas. After it's done, the transaction is done. Khalas. That's it. End. Okay. I handed you the keys. You gave me the cash. Tough luck. Unless you discover a flaw that's something else. Otherwise, once the transaction is done, tough luck. In Islamic law, believe it or not, this is the three madahib, uh, the Hanafis don't agree with this. In Islamic law, you have the right to annul as long as you're still within that framework of the transaction. Even after the transaction is over. Suppose you start talking about something, you know, the weather or whatnot, you're still there with him. And because, you know, the point of the sharia is you have to, as the hadith goes, it is not allowed, this hadith, it is not allowed to take anyone's money except بطيب نفس. His heart is happy in giving it to you. You should not take somebody's money and he's like, man, wh why did I have to do this? I don't want to pay this con. You know, this is not something that, no. It has to be, he wants to be in this contractual relationship. He's happy to purchase this item and you're happy to sell it to him. That's the goal of the sharia, right? And, that's why in the books of fiqh and all of these things are mentioned that generally speaking there is something called khiyar uh, al-majlis. The fiqhi term is khiyar al-majlis. Uh, and there are exceptions and whatnot. Don't, don't start implementing it immediately. But the point is these are things that the books of fiqh mention. And the point of the sharia, the goal of the sharia, you want everybody to be happy with a contract. And that is why the process confirms you're happy with this. Are you okay with it? And Jabir says, yes, I am happy with this. We also learn from this that Jabir then says, I have a condition. What is the condition? I want to ride the camel until I get back to the city. From this, our scholars have said that 
it is Islamic to put any reasonable condition in any contract. Now, of course, the big debate comes, what is reasonable? And that's where the fuqaha differ. But generally speaking, any sensible condition that is understood. So, for example... I purchased a car, uh, and in fact, I remember this happened to me once. Somebody wanted to buy it when I was in Houston as a student. I was leaving uh, for Medina, and I had my old <laughs> uh, uh, Honda uh, Civic of 1986. Mashallah, it's my first car. Uh, my first cars are always, you know, uh, the most, uh, you have the most, uh, you know, memories of them, huh? Attachment to them, yeah. My gray silver hatchback Honda Civic that I had. AC didn't work, but it was still my favorite car. Uh, and uh, s- somebody wanted to f- purchase it when I was leaving for Medina, and I put the condition. Okay, we will agree, but I will get to use the car until the day that I leave. And actually, I got this from the Hadith Hijab when I stayed with my Sheikh. Uh, we went over this Hadith. So he said, this was when I was still in Houston. We went over this Hadith. Said, okay, you can put a condition that you can use the, the item until a certain date. This is permissible. Any contract you have with any person, you can put a reasonable clause in there. Okay. Now the question arises, what if it's unreasonable? And that's where the books of fiqh differ, and we're not going to go into that. But the point is, hadith of Jabir demonstrates you may add reasonable conditions to any contract, and both parties are uh, to be uh, basically honoring those, con- those conditions. And that's why Jabir, even though the camel now belongs to the Prophet Wasallam, he is allowed to use it until... Medina as per the condition uh, once he gets home we also learn over here the uncle is being pragmatic but his name is not mentioned because we cover up the faults of those who have committed even though it's not necessarily a fault per se but you know it's not the best thing for his uncle to have said why did you do this Jane? because it's with the Prophet right? so it's not the best thing to do nonetheless it is mentioned without a name and we see the iman of his wife and he chose correctly we see the iman of his wife and his wife says Sam'an wa ta'a. You said it, we must hear and obey. You have done the deed, we're going to send it you know, to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We also see over here in the response of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Jabir about the issue of marrying. And I've spoken about this in a lot of detail in khutbas, in halaqat, in the class that I teach online about Islamic romance. Uh, I actually began that class like a garment class. I began it with the hadith of Jabir. And I began it with a detailed discussion of uh, some of the wordings of the hadith of Jabir. Some of them are actually pretty explicit. Because Jabir was a young child, again, ch- I keep on saying child, a teenager. He wasn't, yani he wasn't you know, experienced. He didn't have a father figure. He did not have a father figure in his life. And our Prophet ﷺ is teaching him how to be a good husband. And so that's why he's telling him, don't go home right now. You're going to shock her. She's going to be, you know, I mean, she's not, she hasn't seen you for a month. She's not even have taken a bath. She doesn't wear good clothes. That's not how you enter in upon your wife. Let her prepare herself for you. So he's being a father figure to um, to him, uh, like like something that an elder would say, and in fact, in one version of the hadith, he even says, "When you come to your family, then be gentle." Meaning, any everybody remembers, you know, in the young days and whatnot. Maybe it's not she's still newly wed, whatnot. Be gentle with her. Don't be that harsh or not harsh, but hasty or whatnot with her. So he's giving him some very frank advice. Of course, in the phrase. Why didn't you marry a young lady? Uh, obviously, this is because Jabir himself was young. And the default is birds of a feather flock together. The default is people of similar backgrounds get along better. The default is, you know, if you're young, you marry your age. If you're older, you can marry older. It doesn't matter. But for him, it would have made more sense to marry his age. And the hadith is very clear. And I mentioned this in my class on Islamic uh, uh, romance and Islamic sexuality. It is very clear the intent of the hadith. Why didn't you marry a young girl whom you can play with and she can play with you? And you can laugh with and she can laugh with you. There is no denying that there is an element of playfulness in the bedroom that is being intended. And there is no denying that Islam wants us to have healthy marriages in every aspect. And this hadith proves this, that Yes, we want this aspect to be satisfied in a halal manner. And the best way to satisfy it is to find a partner who will be your partner. And that's why you're a young man, Ya Jabir. Why didn't you marry a young lady so that the two of you could find happiness in each other? That's the goal. And here is the Prophet encouraging this marital bliss and asking Jabir to achieve it. Now, Jabir then says he has an excuse. 
And the excuse is, you know, the nine daughters. In which case, the Prophet said, Asabta. Okay, with this excuse, the whole dynamics has changed. And this demonstrates that the spouse is chosen according to obviously one's circumstances. In some cases, a younger spouse is better. In some cases, an older spouse is better. It depends on the circumstances and situation. When Jabir gave his situation, the Prophet said, okay, this is the correct choice. You needed to marry somebody older to take care of your uh, family. Uh, we also see over here, of course, uh, the uh, the barakah of the gifts of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when uh, Jabir brings the camel and uh, the, the payment is made. Oh, one point as well. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never paid exactly what he promised. He always paid more. This was the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu If he promised an amount, when the time came to pay, he would add something. And it is reported in Hadith in Bukhari that a man came to collect his debt and uh, uh, Bilal from the Prophet so The Prophet took a debt from somebody. The man came, wanted his debt back. Jabir said, pay him. Uh, the Prophet said to Bilal, pay him back. So Bilal took the unit and weighed very, very carefully. Like he wants to be exact to the exact line that I owe. That's what you're going to get back, right? And the Prophet wasallam said, Oh Bilal, zid. Bilal, don't be stingy. Increase the amount. And don't fear from the Lord of the throne that you will be deprived. The Lord of the throne, Rabbul Arsh, is going to give you if you give to others. Okay, and in one hadith, uh, he told Bilal, "Zin wa arjih, weigh it and add something more." Okay, weigh what is owed to the man and add. Some- no, Bilal, of course, is the personal secretary. Bilal is the one. Of course, he's a freed man, but we know he dedicated his life to be a voluntary servant of the Prophet He was freed by Abu Bakr, and for the rest of his life, he's essentially a a, a the personal secretary, the the armed guard. You know, in the incident of uh, the, the 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 rumors of divorce, Umar came and found Bilal guarding the door. Even Umar did not have the position of Bilal. Bilal is guarding the door. And Bilal has to go inside and ask permission. He said, the Prophet did not give you permission. Bilal is the one. He didn't give you permission. So Bilal has been raised to this high level because of his khidmah of the Prophet Wasallam. So we learn from this as well that it's always good to be generous and give more. We also learn from this that when you pay your debts and you increase the debt, uh, sorry, you increase the amount that you return, this is not riba. It's not riba. When would it be riba? When it is a condition and agreed upon or understood. Rather, it is sunnah that if uh, uh, I took a loan from you for $1,000, okay, then I pay it back to you. It is sunnah for me to add $20, $50. Say, okay, here, and pay a little bit more. Say, Jazakallah khair, may Allah bless you. It's sunnah to increase. But if you insisted, okay, I'm giving you a thousand, I want back a thousand fifty. This is the essence of riba. This is the essence of riba. But if it was done as a gift, then there is no riba involved over there. And of course, of the benefits of the story, and the main benefit of this entire story is the impeccable, beautiful, majestic akhlaq of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. the whole incident from beginning to end was a halal trick. The whole incident from beginning to end was a ruse to cheer Jabir up, to make him feel special, to make him feel that I'm not just giving you some charity, to make him feel that I'm going to give you some, some money as if it's a transaction and then the Prophet is telling him, O oh, Jabir, O oh, son of my brother. So he called his father his brother. O oh, son of my brother, Yabna Akhi, did you think that I would cheat you of your camel? Go take the money and take the camel. And it shows you that it is halal to gift something to anyone. Yani, even if a transaction has been made, the, the one who owns can do whatever he or she wants. And that's why, for example, even when it comes to the mahr, and it is of the greatest hukuk, is the mahr, of the greatest hukuk, Allah Azza wa Jalla says in the Quran, you must give the mahr to your wives. فَإِن طِبْنَ لَكُمْ عَنْ شَيْءٍ مِنْهُ نَسًا فَكُلُوا هَرِئًا مَرِئًا If they are willing to and happy to gift back some of it to me, okay, I forgive half the mahr, then go ahead and take that. So Allah says, you must give the mahr. It is haram to not give the mahr. Then Allah says, but if the haqq of the wife 
is hers. And she says, okay, if they give some of it back, then kulu hani, go ahead and eat of it. Hani and maria, happily and content. Don't worry, it will be halal for you. Here, same thing as well, that the Prophet now owns the camel and he gives it back to Jabir. So Jabir got the money in a, in a merchandise transaction. It wasn't sadaqah. And then the merchandise belongs to the Prophet Then he gifts it to Jabir. And so Jabir ends up with a halal transaction and his merchandise back. And that was the whole point of the uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Other things as well as we wrap up the story of Jabir, it is reported that once Jabir took a loan from a Yahudi, maybe this is the same loan as his father. We're not quite sure. Maybe it's the same loan that his father had. And the repayment of the loan, Jabir did not have any money, the repayment of the loan would be certain dates that were growing, that when the dates came, he would cut the dates and give it to that Yehudi. But it so happened that there was a disease or something and the crops did not come that year. So the Yehudi came and said, give me my money back. And this might be the debt of his father, we're not sure, the hadith is not mentioned, it might be that debt, that, that his father is saying, I have a debt, you pay it off. Uh, so he said, give me my money back. So Jabir took him to the small garden and said, look, it's not my fault. Give me until next year when the next crop comes. And the Yehudi said, no, the condition was this year and I need my money back. And Jabir said, I don't have anything to give you. So he said, I will complain to the Prophet about you because the contract was for a year and this is the year. So the matter was raised to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made shafa'a for Jabir in front of the Yahudi and said, give him another year. And the man said, no. Said, give him another year three times until the Yahudi swore, Ya Abul Qasim. That, oh, Abul Qasim, that's what the Yahud would call him. The Muslims would not say that to him in that manner. Ya Abul Qasim, I will not give him any extension. Now the haqq technically was with whom here? Was the Yahudi. And you cannot get, yani this is the, 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 the beauty of our religion and Islamic law. Okay, shafa'a was made. And it's halal to make shafa'a. But in the end, it is the haqq. The condition was this year. And the Yehudi is saying, I don't care. It's not my fault. I want my money. I do not give permission for any delay. So the Prophet Wasallam then said to Jabir, show me your garden. So Jabir took him to the garden and he walked around the garden and the Prophet said, where is your, uh, the Arabic word is, is uh, hash is a hut. In those days, every garden would have um, a small place that was covered that people would just sit in to shelter themselves. You know, if they needed to just rest or whatnot. Where is the place you sit in the garden like that? So Jabir pointed out a place. So the Prophet sat there and made dua and went to sleep. And Jabir is waiting for the Prophet to wake up. When he woke up, he presented some dates from the garden. Whatever was there, he ate. And the Prophet ﷺ said, O oh Jabir, go and cut the dates now and return the debt to the Yahudi. Jabir looked and lo and behold, the whole garden was blooming with dates. So he said, I cut and I cut and I cut and I returned all of the debt and what I had left was more than I ever had for any year of my life. And I went and informed the Prophet ﷺ of this and the Prophet ﷺ laughed and said, Ashhadu anni Rasulullah. Because that's what the Prophet said, I bear witness that I am Rasulullah. So this is of the miracles as well given to Jabir. And we're not sure, but it might be the debt of his father. So that adds to the sanctity because his father was a shaheed. So it adds to the sanctity of the death, death, debt. And that's what would make sense as well, uh, that it is that and Allah knows best. We also have just one or two things we're done. Uh, We also have uh, that one time Jabir fell sick very severely and he felt that he would die. And so the Prophet ﷺ heard of the sickness, so he visited Jabir in his house. He visited Jabir in his house, and this is a great honor for Jabir radiallahu an that the Prophet ﷺ visited him in his house. And uh, Jabir asked Rasulullah ﷺ that, Ya Rasulullah, I'm gonna, uh, I think I might die. Of course, he did not die. He lived another 70 years after this, 80 years after this, uh, 75 years after this. But he said, I think I'm going to die, and I don't have any children, and you know my parents are gone. So what will happen of my inheritance? So to answer this question, Allah revealed in the Quran what is now the last verse of Surah An-Nisa, which is, يَسْتَفْتُونَكَ 
قُلِ اللَّهُ يُفْتِيكُمْ فِي الْكَلَالَ This is the kalala. Who is the kalala? The kalala in Arabic uh, means the one who has no ascendants and no descendants. قُلِ اللَّهُ يُفْتِيكُمْ فِي الْكَلَالَ Allah will give you fatwa about the kalala. The kalala is the man uh, or the woman who has no parents and no children alive. And who was this? Jabir. At the time, he didn't have any children. He was to have many children. At this time, he has no children. قُلِ اللَّهُ يُفْتِيكُمْ فِي الْكَلَالَ إِنِ امْرُؤٌ هَلَكَ وَلَيْسَ لَهُ وَلَدٌ وَلَهُ أُخْتٌ فَلَهَا نِصْفُ مَا تَرَكْ وَهُوَ يَرِثُهَا لُمْ يَكُلْ لَهَا وَلَدْ فَإِنْ كَانَتَ اثْنَتَنِ فَلْهُمْ الثُّلُثَانِ مِمَا تَرَكْ So the point is that Allah revealed essentially that two-thirds of his wealth will go to his sisters. It's in the Qur'an. Of course, Jabir's name is not there, but it is revealed because of Jabir that when he has sisters, then two-thirds are going to go to the sisters. So all of the wealth of Jabir, basically two-thirds would have gone to the nine uh, sisters. Of course, he lived a long time after this. He participated in many battles, uh, and he was of the key players in the conquest of Syria and Damascus. And it is also said that he participated in the battle of Safin with Ali against Muawiyah. Uh, and after this battle, this tragic battle, he stopped all political and military matters and he just dedicated himself to the masjid and he became one of the first people to have a halaqa of knowledge in the Prophet ﷺ's masjid. So every day he would go and he would teach the people a hadith. And Allah blessed him to live a very, very, very long life. And he died in the year 78 Hijrah, the last of the great Sahaba to die in Medina. 78, think about that. 78. The majority of Sahaba died by 40 or 50 Hijrah. Jabir was the last of the great giants to die in Medina. Yes, there were some who died other places, Anas. Ibn Malik died in Basra and others. You know, Jabir and Anas were young. You know, the, Anas was younger than Jabir. We'll talk about Anas maybe next week. Jabir was 15 when he met the Prophet. Anas was 7. So Anas was younger. But Jabir lived a long life. He died at the age of 94 years old. And towards the end of his life, he became uh, blind. And uh, he would have a halaqa in the Prophet's masjid. And he became famous for narrating hadith so much so that he became in the top five narrators of hadith, or some say top six, either the fifth or the sixth. Jabir ibn Abdullah is number five or number six when it comes to the quantity of a hadith that uh, narrated. Number one is Abu Hurairah, number two is Ibn Umar, number three is Aisha, Anas, number four is Aisha, number five, Ibn Abbas. And Jabir number six or the other way around. Ibn Abbas and Jabir both have similar numbers. Jabir has around 1,600 a hadith. Jabir has around 1,600 a hadith. And he was very, very meticulous to record and preserve hadith. I just have one hadith I want to quote you uh, from the Muslim Imam Ahmad, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, which is famous in the books of hadith. Imam al-Bukhari references it in a chapter heading in the Sahih, but he doesn't have the Hadith. Imam al-Bukhari references what I'm about to narrate to you, but he doesn't have it in his book. And it shows you the Iman, the Taqwa, and the, the eagerness of Jabir to study knowledge. Jabir radiallahu anh narrates that I heard that one of the Sahaba of the Prophet sallallahu has a Hadith that I did not have. So I purchased a camel for that. And I traveled to him one month till I reached Syria. Jabir was in Medina. And it would take one month to get to Syria. So I purchased a camel and traveled one month to meet him. And he was Abdullah ibn Unais. And I went to the house of Abdullah ibn Unais. And I knocked on the door. The servant came out and said, who is there? I said, Jabir. So the servant went back, went back in and Abdullah ibn Unais said, which Jabir? Oh, I don't know any Jabir. And then he says, is it Jabir ibn Abdullah? And he stood up in his izar, meaning he's sleeping, lying down. And he rushes out and he saw me and hugged me. And I said immediately, I have heard that you have a hadith about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam regarding uh, retributions on judgment day. And I was scared that either you might die or I might die before I heard it from you. So I traveled here to hear that hadith from you. So immediately Abdullah ibn Yunais said, I heard the Prophet ﷺ say, now pause here. What is the point of this so far? Ab Jabir traveled 
one month for what? One hadith. Think about that. And Imam al-Bukhari has in his chapter heading, and Jabir ibn Abdullah traveled one month to hear one hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. That's in Sahih Bukhari. He doesn't have this story because this story is Hassan, not Sahih. It's, it's B level, not A. So Bukhari cannot have the story. But he references it in the chapter heading. And he says, وَرَحَلَ Jabir ibn Abdullah شَهْرًا لِسَمَاءِ حَدِيث Jabir uh, traveled one month to listen to the hadith. And look, he purchased the camel, he travels the month, he just wants this hadith. He hasn't even rested the camel, freshened up the doorstep, on the doorstep. He goes, I heard you have a hadith, I want to hear before I die or you die. And Abdullah ibn Unais understands how important this is, right? Then and there, he answers and he says, I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, and this is the famous hadith, يُحْشَرُ النَّاسِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَوْ قَالُ يُحْشَرُ الْعِبَادِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ عُرَاتًا غُرْلًا بُهْمَا قَالَ قُلْنَا يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَمَا بُهْمَا قَالَ لَيْسَ مَعْهُمْ شَيْءٍ ثُمَّ يُنَادِيهُمْ بِصَوْتٍ يَسْمَعُهُ مِنْ مَنْ بَعُودَ كَمَا يَسْمَعُهُ مَنْ قَرُوبٍ أنا الملك أنا الديان ولا ينبغي لأحد من أهل النار أن يدخل النار وله عند أحد من أهل الجنة حق حتى وقصه منه ولا ينبغي and the hadith goes on it's a beautiful hadith the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said Allah will resurrect the people on judgment day عراتا naked غرلا uncircumcised بهما the sahaba said what is the meaning of بهم it's a very exotic word they never heard it what is بهم so the Prophet ﷺ said, meaning without any possessions. Naked, barefoot, uncircumcised, without money, without luggage, without anything. You will be the day that, like your mother created you or gave birth to you, excuse me, that's going to be nothing. And Allah will then speak with a voice that the one who is close will hear it like the one who is far. And Allah will say, أَنَا الْمَلِكُ أَنَا الدَّيَّانِ I am the king, I am the judge. And no one of the people of hellfire shall enter hellfire until he has taken his haq from the people of Jannah. And no one from the people of Jannah will enter Jannah until he has taken his haq from the people of Jahannam. So they said, O Messenger of Allah, how will they take their haq when we don't have anything? You said we're going to be buhma, we're not going to have money, we're not going to have possessions. How will we take our haq? So the, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Bil Hasanati was Sayyat. The haq will be taken with good and bad uh, deeds. The haq will be taken with good and bad deeds. So this is the famous hadith of Jabir ibn Abdullah. And as soon as he heard it, he went back on his camel and returned to Medina. Two months he spent just to get one hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Pause here. I always you know tell my students when I teach them hadith. The reason why we are so behind, even though we have more access to knowledge than even the early Sahaba or early you know, scholars did, you know, we can purchase, actually not even purchase, these days you can Google and download more books than Imam al-Shafi'i had access to, Imam Malik had memorized, Imam Abu Hanifa had, you, ha- you can have them on your hard drive within 10 minutes. I, I, I was in Mecca, Medina a few weeks ago. As you know, somebody gifted me the latest copy of it. It's called Ashamila. It's uh, the largest encyclopedia. Everybody knows the, in Students of Knowledge Ashamila what it is. On a CD, there are, I don't even know, 15,000 volumes or something like just some ludicrous number on PDF and everything. It is larger than my library at home. And some of you have seen my library at home. That one CD has the keys. You put it in and it'll download on automatically. You will gain access to essentially any book of the classical tradition of Islam that has ever been printed. You will get that immediately. So we have more access to knowledge than even what the classical fuqaha ever did. Yet, of what use is that? Why? Simple. And I use this incident, inshallah, with this to conclude. How do you think Jabir valued that hadith? When he traveled one month just to hear it. How do you think it impacted him? Think about that. Right? And for us, subhanAllah, just Google it, look it up. Yeah, and you know, what, what value is it, right? Imam Malik, when he was dictating the Muatta and his student was writing down, he commented, he said that I have spent 35 years writing this book 
and you just took it from me in a week, how will you ever appreciate it? Now, this student, by the way, hand wrote the dictation of Imam Malik. We don't even do that. What do we do? Download a PDF and we just have it for free. Or we purchase a collection, 40, 50 volumes I have of Muslim Muhammad. 50 volumes. Is this the same as somebody who writes? Is this the same as Imam Ahmad who actually traveled and studied and memorized? So it's not that we don't have access to the knowledge. It's that we will not appreciate what the early Salaf and Sahaba did. In any case, so he passed away in the year 78, the last of the great Sahaba to die in Medina. And at that time, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf was around and he wrote in his will, Hajjaj will not lead my janazah. And so Hajjaj did not lead his janazah, rather uh, another great tabi'i and the son of one of the greatest sahaba, Aban ibn Uthman ibn Affan, led his janazah, and Jabir was then buried in Baqi'ul Gharqad, where his grave is to this day. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gather us in the ranks of Jabir ibn Abdullah. Inshallah, we'll continue our stories from the sahaba next week. Time is already late, so any announcements to be made? Nothing to be made? Okay, inshallah, we'll break here and meet next week, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.